Chapter 99, Sixth Year, Parties and Pustules Sunday the 31st of October, 1976 The 1976 Hogwarts Halloween feast was so terrible that Remus's first order of business immediately afterwards was to get as drunk as humanly possible. It wasn't terrible in an outward kind of way, of course. The food was delicious, as usual. A glorious golden hog roast with apple crumble covered in goopy yellow custard for pudding. It was just terrible for Remus. Sirius wasn't rude, or cold. He wasn't even trying to avoid Remus. It was exactly his dreadful dedication to normality that made it so awful. He smiled. He laughed. He joked. He called Remus Mooney, without a trace of shame. Remus had no choice but to follow his lead. After all... He'd promised not to tell. Mind you, he hadn't the first clue how you would tell someone a thing like that. Oi, James, has Sirius ever got in a bed with you and then sort of ended up touching quite a bit? Oh God, what if he had? There's also Lily, of course, the most sympathetic person Remus knew after James, though the thought of talking to a girl about that sort of thing was mortifying. Mary was the most sexually experienced person Remus knew, and he absolutely 100% could not talk to her about Sirius. Not that she'd have been upset. As the party got into full swing, Remus knocked back three shots of whiskey as soon as the opportunity presented. Mary descended from the girl's dorm, dressed to kill in a very tight red dress, which made even Remus stare for a few seconds. Roman Rotherhide of Ravenclaw was first to offer her a drink, and the two spent the rest of the evening entirely absorbed in each other, in one way or another. Remus sulked by the record player for a bit, deliberately putting on the most abrasive, least danceable records he could find. The Stooges, Will We Fall, swiftly followed by Sister Ray, then some Captain Beefheart for good measure. Eventually, he was overpowered by a group of fourth-year girls, who ganged up on him clutching David Cassidy and Bay City Rollers LPs. After that, he devoted himself to the punch bowl. Sirius was having a good time, obviously. He and James were gregarious hosts, as always, making the rounds like the good pure-blood heirs they were. The common room kept filling up as students came from all over the castle. It got so warm that Remus ended up taking a bottle of witch's brew he'd topped up with whiskey and sitting alone by the open window chain-smoking. Marlene approached at some point to see if he was okay, and to ask if Sirius was seeing anyone else, now that he and Mary were over. Remus scowled at the hopeful look in her eyes, and told her he didn't give a shit. She frowned, but left him alone after that. At about nine o'clock, things got really hazy. The last thing he remembered was Peter and Desdemona's high-pitched perfect performance of Paradise by the Dashboard Light. Trust Peter to like Meatloaf, out of all of the buggle music in the world. Remus vaguely remembered smiling stupidly as the pair of them flung each other about the room, red and sweating but having the time of their lives, belting out the duet at the top of their lungs. The next thing Remus knew, he was in the dorm bathroom, bent over the toilet bowl, choking his guts out. He must have got there a bit late, because his shirt and trousers were wet and stinking. The room whirled and lurched, and he lay down on the soothing cold tiles, as the closing bars of Rebel Rebel wafted up the stairs. Oi, Mooney! Wakey, wakey, mate! James's voice boomed into his throbbing head a few hours later. Oh, oh bloody hell! James sighed. Scarify! Come on, up you get! It's Padfoot's turn to puke! Remus blinked at the bright light, and he crawled to his feet. Their bathroom was small to begin with, just a room for a sink, toilet and a bathtub. There wasn't really room for three lanky 16-year-old boys, two of whom were so drunk they could barely stand. Remus backed into the sink as Sirius flung himself at the toilet bowl, throwing up noisily. Luckily, his hair was tied back. Remus blinked again, staring dopily at him for a while, before James gently yanked him up by the elbow. Come on, Mooney, me old pal. Time for bed, yeah? Hmm. He mumbled, feeling childish and helpless. He allowed James to lead him out of the bathroom and towards his bed. Ugh. 
The sheets were still rumpled, and Sirius's record player was still perched precariously at the foot. James moved this, as rumours clambered under the covers, still in his jeans and socks. <laughs> you were supposed to be the responsible one, James huffed, jokily, as he drew the bed curtains. Night-night, Mooney. James! Sirius whined from the bathroom. James tutted, and Remus closed his eyes. The hangover the next day was so horrendous, Remus thought he'd probably never drink again. Wednesday, the 10th of November, 1976. In the week that followed, Remus was completely on edge whenever Sirius was around. They weren't ever alone together, and it was hard to tell whether or not this had been engineered by Sirius, or whether it was just a consequence of being at boarding school. Certainly, Remus made no effort to catch him alone. Who knew what might happen? There were plenty of explanations. Of this, he was certain. He just had to think about it. Perhaps Sirius was just up for it. They were both teenage boys, after all. Remus had been readily available, and hadn't put up any resistance. Perhaps this was the sort of thing rich boys did at boarding school. Find a bit of rough to rub up against. It could even be a bit of Sirius's canine side coming out. The worst part was that Remus didn't actually care what the reason had been. He just wanted it to happen again. As guilty as he knew he ought to feel, he spent every night lying in his bed and wishing, wishing that Sirius would come creeping over. Or that he, Remus, had the courage to get up and go to Sirius himself. But the courage never came, and after a week, which comprised of Sirius's birthday, a Hogsmeade weekend, bonfire night, and a full moon, Remus simply had to try and give up on it. As usual, when facing a crisis, Remus had composed a trusty list to help out his thinking. This one was titled, Reasons to Forget the Sirius Situation. 1. Sirius clearly wanted to pretend it had never happened. A good friend ought to respect his wishes. 2. Remus wanted to be a good friend because, after all, losing a friend was potentially much worse than never touching Sirius again, wasn't it? Number 3. Sirius was making no bones about his deep abiding attraction to girls. All girls. Every girl. This last point was the most salient, a contributing factor to Remus's messy downfall at the Halloween party had been Sirius's dogged attempts to flirt with every girl in the room over 15. Extremely successful attempts. By the time the next weekend rolled around, it was common knowledge that Sirius was now casually seeing Anvi Chaudhry, the Hufflepuff who had enchanted the pumpkins to glow in the dark. This was a familiar situation, by now and Remus was at least glad he wasn't a prefect anymore, and ran no risk of stumbling upon Sirius and Adphne snogging in the astronomy tower. He did start avoiding the greenhouses, though. Life plodded on. Remus's study group slowly rebanded, sliding up to him one by one in the common room, or the library, to politely inquire whether the seat next to him was taken, and then, once he had confirmed its availability, settling in and asking if he would mind just checking something for them, or giving his opinion on some point or another. Remus didn't mind. It was a good distraction, and much healthier than getting stoned, at least. Christopher did not join in, but Remus supposed he might just be busy with his owls. The third full moon of the year went just as well as the previous two. James swore he'd caught sight of a unicorn, really, really this time. And the lessons with Madame Pomfrey became an unexpected delight, to the point where Remus was now competent at healing minor abrasions and bruises. No more TCP for him. So really, he told himself repeatedly, he, Remus John Lupin, had no reason at all to be unhappy. Everything was as it should be. Even James and Lily were getting along without any hexes or curses being thrown. The emptiness was only inside him. His outer life was fuller than ever. In light of all this, he was quite surprised to receive a letter one quiet afternoon in the library. Actually, received a letter might be overstating it. 
A paper airplane stabbed him in the back of his head while he was trying to concentrate on converting an Agrippan arithmetic equation into the Chaldean form. He hissed in pain and grabbed it, glaring around. He was alone, but he knew exactly who was to blame. James's locomotive charms were legendary. He unfolded it, smoothed it out, and began to read. Marauders assemble. We have lain dormant too long. Tonight, midnight. Garden tapestry. Mischief. He couldn't help but smile. They hadn't done a proper prank in ages. Thursday the 11th of November, 1976. Midnight. Who's that? It's me. Oh, hiya, Mooney. You found the cloak then? Serious with you? No, I, I thought he was with you. Nah, I had patrol. What about Wormtail? He's here, on my shoulder. We didn't fit otherwise. You two are making so much noise. Padfoot! Prongs. How did you get here without the cloak? I walked, you wuss. Lucky Filch didn't see you. I was born lucky. The garden tapestry was on the ground floor, only a few yards away from the entrance to the dungeons. From this, rumours had surmised that the prank would be aimed at the Slytherins. He was not wrong. James had a very large wooden box with him, which he was propelling along with his painted locomotion charm. Some of the bubo tubers accidentally crossbred with some puffball mushrooms he whispered as they crept down the stairs to the dungeons. Professor Sprout asked me to chuck them out onto the compost heap, but I thought that would be a waste. Where are we going to put them? Sirius whispered back excitedly. Well, I don't know this year's Slytherin password. Any of you? They all shook their heads, except for Peter, who, still perched on James's shoulder, gave a negative-sounding squeak. James sighed, only mildly disappointed. Then, I thought we should probably just leave them scattered about. They're just about ready to spore, I reckon. Once they had reached the dingy, cave-like lower levels of the castle, Peter transformed back into himself, and James set down his crate. He lifted the lid to present a bounty of at least 100 large, yellowish, gently pulsating mushrooms. Ugh, Peter said. Yep, James grinned, lifting one carefully out of the box. It was about the size of a tennis ball. Don't squeeze them. They're full of puss and ready to blow. This is going to be excellent, Sirius grinned, reaching in and grabbing two. They quickly and efficiently began squirreling away the weird, pimplish fungus behind sconces, over doorways, under carpets and inside suits of armour. The puffball bubo tubers, hybrids, were throbbing unpleasantly in their hands, and rumours thought James was right. They were ready to go off at any minute, leaving the dungeons covered in foul smelling yellow puss. They had maybe half finished with the box when Rumus' ears pricked. He had the strange sense he was being watched. Whirling around, he spotted the yellow glowing eyes of Mrs. Norris peering around the corner with that smug, spiteful look on her squashed face. Shit, he whispered. Quick, look. Oh, bugger, James said. You three take the cloak and hide. I'll... Who's there? Filcher's voice barked. Quick, James hissed and began running in the opposite direction. Peter, Sirius and Remus looked at each other, before telepathically deciding to duck into the nearest open doorway, which just so happened to be the girl's lose. That fucking cat has it in for me, Sirius muttered, ever since I became an animagus. You can talk, Peter replied testily, wringing his hands. Rimmers had dragged the box of mushrooms in behind them and was desperately looking for a place to hide it. Push it in front of the door, Sirius said. I don't think that will... Locomotor! No! Sirius was not as good at his charms as James, and always put a bit too much force behind it. 
It was all Remus could do to duck down and cover his head as the crate of delicate pubo tub of puffballs slammed loudly into the bathroom door, setting off every last pustule with a sickening squelch. Peter disappeared completely, shrinking down to rat size at the very last moment and scuttling down the nearest drain for refuge. Sirius, ever confident in his abilities, simply stood there looking stupid as gallons and gallons of pus exploded in his face, coating the entire bathroom in the process. It was sometimes very easy not to idolise Sirius Black. Chapter 100 Six Year Boundaries Friday the 12th of November, 1976 They were caught, of course, just Sirius and Remus. Peter's quick thinking had got him out of it, and James had run fast enough in time. He wanted to tell McGonagall that the whole thing had been his idea, but Sirius wouldn't let him. Their head of house gave them one of the worst dressing downs they'd had in years, made all the worse by the fact she was clad in her tartan nighty and dressing gown, which was not amusing in the slightest, but extremely terrifying. They stood in her office, heads hung, dripping pus until she dismissed them to bed. Twenty points lost, and detention until Christmas. Ah oh well. You both have an hour free before lunch tomorrow, she said, as a parting barb. I expect both of you to report to the dungeons in order to clean up your mess. Without magic. Sirius was furious. After he'd washed, he went to bed without another word. Pete sat on the end of his own bed, looking pale-faced and worried. I'm really sorry, he whispered to Remus desperately. I panicked. Sometimes I just lose control when I'm scared. It's okay, Remus replied tiredly. It's only detention. Anyway, James piped up from his bed. They didn't find any of the puffballs we hid. Yet. James was quite right, and in a sublime twist of fate, the bubo tuba puffballs exploded early the next morning, just as the Slytherin students were on their way from the dungeons to the Great Hall for breakfast. So at least the evening had not been a complete waste of time. It was you two! Lily stared at Remus, amazed, when he told her why he couldn't meet her in the library before lunch. Not Black and Potter. Black and you. Don't have to act that surprised, he frowned. I'm capable of being an idiot as much as anyone else is. No, but I thought you and Sirius were on the outs. Why do you think that? Oh, something Mary said, I, I suppose. What did Mary say? Remus felt a flare of heat shoot up his neck. Had Sirius told Mary something? Some stupid slip of the tongue while they were cozying up together? I don't know. Lily looked mildly surprised. Ask her. I can't really remember. I just thought she said something about the two of you not talking. Anyway, if you could please try not to destroy any more bathrooms this year. Gryffindor's got the lowest house points already, and it's not even Christmas. The surprise corridor attacks had lost 20 more house points off Gryffindor, and an extra night's detention for Remus and Sirius. James was terribly guilty, but Sirius's sense of chivalry and honour got in the way, and he wouldn't let him confess. Of course, it was a very different story later that day, when he and Remus were standing outside the cordoned off bathroom, waiting for Filch to arrive with buckets and mops. Bloody Wormtail! This is all his fault. No, it isn't, Remus yawned, leaning against the wall. He hadn't had enough sleep. The little twerp ran away again like the vermin he is. Hey, be nice, Remus frowned. He only did that because someone got overexcited and blew up all of those mushrooms. I was thinking on my feet. Sirius raised his chin defiantly. You weren't thinking at all. Well, you weren't doing anything. I was trying to hide it. If we'd hidden the box and gotten under the cloak, no one would have got in any trouble at all. Well, 
You didn't say that at the time, Sirius snapped. You didn't give me a chance. He still didn't have to run away. Sirius folded his arms, leaning against the opposite wall. Tired and grumpy, Remus spat back. James ran away too. Don't see you cursing his name. Sirius glared at him furiously. How dare anyone speak against James Potter in the presence of Sirius Black? Remus rolled his eyes and stared at the ceiling until Filch arrived. Argus Filch was one of the most unpleasant adults Remus had ever met. Matron would have liked him. A bitter, spiteful, creepy man on the wrong side of middle age. Filch was a caretaker and a sneak who seemed to hate students more than anyone who worked in a school really ought to. This was never more evident than when he was permitted to administer detentions. He dropped two large wooden buckets at their feet with a malicious grin on his face and pushed the door open. Overnight, the pus seemed to have dried and left a thick yellowish crust over most of the surfaces it had hit. Remus wrinkled his nose. Filch handed them both mops and scrubbing brushes. I'll be back to check on you in two hours, he said. You ought to be done by then. No ones, no funny business. He sneered as he left them to it. Remus looked at Sirius, who was obviously still annoyed at him. He straightened his back. I'll start over there, he nodded at the far end of the bathroom. You go over there, he indicated at the opposite end. Fine. Remus shrugged, lifting his bucket and filling it at the sink. Yes, actually, that was fine. They'd keep to their own sides and just get this stupid thing over with. Sirius still wasn't talking to him and turned his back, working in silence. Remus followed suit. Two could play that game. Sirius was making it much easier. Remus would never admit it, but he didn't mind cleaning and found it quite satisfying. As disgusting as the pus looked, it came away from the white tiles easily with a bit of soap and water, so the work wasn't too physically taxing, until it came to wiping down the walls. This was harder just because of all the reaching and stretching, which tired him out and made his shoulders ache. Additionally, bubotuber pus wasn't actually pus, according to the herbology textbook Remus had skimmed in a hurry before turning up to clean it. It wasn't that dirty or toxic. In fact, it had several healing properties, and while this gunk was from an accidental crossbred strain, it probably couldn't do any more harm than pumpkin juice. The little bathroom was eerily quiet, with the two boys silently working, and only the occasionally sloshing sound of them filling up their buckets, or swabbing the floor. Remus didn't mind the cold atmosphere. It actually helped him concentrate. He had known for a long time that his feelings for Sirius rarely got in the way of his ability to be irritated by Sirius. By the time the first hour was up, they had managed to remove all traces of the mess, and all that was left to do was a final rinse down. Remus rinsed his bucket a few more times, and took the opportunity to wash his hands and his face, which had grown hot from exertion. Sirius joined him at the sink, but they didn't speak. Nearly finished. Remus tried, tentatively. Sirius snorted, annoyed. No thanks to Worm. Shut up about Wormtail, will you? Remus said, exasperated. Grow up. Sirius frowned and said nothing. He washed his hands and face too. Remus tried not to watch. He turned back to his own wall and began squeezing clear water across it, swiping away what was left of the soap suds. A shadow appeared at his shoulder, and he braced himself for more bickering. You missed a bit, Sirius huffed grumpily, elbowing Remus out of the way and scrubbing it himself. Affronted, Remus scowled back at him. I thought we were sticking to our own sides. Yeah, thought you could be trusted to do a decent job. I didn't have you breathing down my neck the whole time. You're so sensitive, Sirius snapped. Nah, you're just acting like a prick. Remus elbowed him, harder than he really meant to. Sirius shoved him against the wall, and Remus slipped, grabbing Sirius to steady himself. 
Furious, he pushed him back. Wanka, he said. Sirius kissed him. Sirius kissed like nobody else, languid, firm and unhurried. Remus responded instantly, hands fisting the material of Sirius's shirt, wanting to run his fingers through the other boy's hair. But Sirius broke away before he could. Stepping back, looking horrified with himself, his lips were pink and shining, slightly parted. Remus had to look away. Remus, I'm... Shit, I'm sorry. I don't know what keeps happening to me. It's okay, Remus said, not meeting his eyes. You know I'm not a... Yeah, Remus said. Yeah, of course, me neither, he said quickly and without thinking. He said it to stop Sirius saying that word. They were quiet for a bit more. Remus's heart was racing. He could hardly think straight. He reached out, catching the thin white fabric of Sirius's shirt between his fingers and tugging it slightly, finally meeting Sirius's eyes. No one's going to find out, Remus said quietly, echoing something he had been told once. Sirius gazed back at him, his eyes burning. You won't say anything. Remus shook his head as Sirius came a little closer. Remus continued, braver now. I won't. We... We don't have to stop. Unless you want to. Sirius kissed him, full on the mouth again. They both knew they had crossed a line, but it couldn't be helped now. And it was so, so good. And their bodies were hard against each other, hands fumbling with belt buckles as if they'd known this was the plan all along. Once it was over, they clung to each other for long, exhausted seconds. Then Sirius withdrew carefully, stepping back. Remus longed to pull him close again, to never stop. He touched Sirius's hair one last time, pretending to push it back into place. They stared into each other's eyes, bold and unashamed, for a few short seconds. You're lovely, Sirius said so softly. Remus could only smile back gently. He didn't know what to say. The room had grown cold. Come on. Sirius started buttoning his trousers, looking away finally. We'd better finish this cleaning. Remus nodded, still mute, unable to do much more than lean back against the wall as he watched Sirius wash his hands again and pick up his mop. The sight of him walking away was too familiar. And Remus burst out. You're not... Don't run off this time. Sirius looked back, a bit surprised. And then a bit something else. I'm not going anywhere, Mooney. He spoke gently. Oh. Okay. Good then. I felt bad about that. Last time. Sorry. He was on the other side of the room now and maybe that made it easier to talk. But I thought you'd be angry or something. I don't know. No, I wasn't. We're still friends, aren't we? Of course. We'll always be friends, Padfoot. Remus was making a promise, though his brain was too foggy to really recognise it at the time. Sirius had acknowledged, however shyly, that whatever kept happening was probably going to keep happening. He had assumed the role he always did, impulsive, expectant and irresponsible. For his part, Remus took up his own mantle, the one who would be responsible. He would keep the secrets. He would accept what he was given. He would be responsible. If those are the things he needs, Remus decided, then those are the things I can give him. It was nothing at all. Brave, Sirius had called him once, in another bathroom not so long ago. Remus hadn't known then whether he was or not, really, but he had liked the sound of it at the time, and he liked it even more now, now with the taste of Sirius still on his lips and the echoes of pleasure still settling in his body. As he watched Sirius finish sluicing down the far wall, encouraging the water down the drain with his mop, and glancing up to smile now and then, Remus realised that what he'd been waiting for all this time was for Sirius to be brave. What occurred to him now, with the clarity of a lightning bolt, was that he, Remus, 
could be brave for the both of them. End of chapter 100